Anybody got their this morning? Yes. Awesome. Thanks for coming out and worshiping with us. My name is Michael Moore, and I have the privilege of serving as pastor of this wonderful, growing, on mission group of believers here in Jesus Christ. So I thank you for coming out and being part of us this morning. And I do believe that everybody has a gift to be used for God's glory. Every single one of us has been given a gift to be used to, to really just exalt Jesus and make much of him. And that's never been so more evident than today. We are blessed today to have Kelly and her team with k Studios that are here today to give out free haircuts for those in need after service. And yeah. so God bless that. And that. That is awesome. So if, you, if you're not able to get one, uh, please stop by. We're going to go right out the door to the left after service and get your haircut for free. And one blessed person will get their hair cut personally by me. So make sure, <laughs> make sure that you uh, stick around after service and somebody is very nervous right now. No. No. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, make sure, if you're, if you're here every, every Sunday, we give out meals. And so if you are um, if you want a meal, need a meal, uh, we're going to do that all in the same direction. If you're worried about getting your hair cut, missing a meal, and if you get your hair cut, we'll set aside a meal for you. We will make sure everybody is taken care of. And man, they're so awesome, uh, Kelly and her team, that they're not just going to stop here. They're going to leave here and go to our church plant in Richmond and do the same thing this afternoon. And so I am thankful for them. Uh, very thankful for them. So uh, it is awesome, man. Uh, if I haven't given the chance to meet you yet, please stop by. I'll be out in the hallway after service. I'd love to get a chance to meet you and just thank you for being here. See how we can pray for you. We have prayer cards where we'll hand out. Matter of fact, if you got a prayer need in your life, just raise your hand and one of our, our prayer team members will come and give you a, a prayer card and they'll just give back to me after service. We'd love to get a chance to pray for you and intercede uh, for you this week. You can pray about after service too out by the hallway. Right now it is preaching time. So ladies and gentlemen, if you go ahead and grab your Bibles and turn with me to Malachi chapter 3, where we'll start in verse 13 and go to the end of the chapter. Actually, the end of the book. If you don't have a copy of God's Word for you today, we have you covered. Just raise your hand and they'll bring a copy for you to use. And if you don't have one at home, please take it with you as our gift to you this morning. Uh, we love giving uh, copies of God's Word out to the hands of people who desire to grow in God's uh, Word and knowledge. So also, I talk very, very fast, if you have to figure that out. So we have about 15 copies of today's sermon manuscript. Uh, if you want to follow along, just raise your hand. They'll bring you a copy of today's sermon manuscript. You can also stop by after service, and we will uh, just give you your email address, and we will start emailing uh, you a copy of the sermon every Saturday, along with selling all your information to somebody that can pay for it. So, all right. Just joking on that, all right? So, if you're able, please stand now in honor of reading God's holy word. Malachi chapter 3, verse 13 through the end of the book. Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. But you say, how have we spoken against you? You have said it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. In the day when I make up my treasured possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his son and who serves him. Those, once more, you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts. So that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. You should go out leaping like calves from the stall. And you shall tread down on the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statue and rules that I commanded him at Oreb for all of Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will return the hearts of fathers to their children, and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land 
with a decree of utter destruction. Let us pray. Dearly Father, I thank you and I praise you for your word. Lord, I thank you for teaching us so much through the book of Malachi. Lord, it's been a, just for me, it's just been a growth book. Lord, all 66 books you've given us are for us to learn about you, to grow in you, and to live on mission for you. The Bible is not about us, it's about Jesus. And so, Lord, I pray this morning as I proclaim your word, I pray that you would help speak through me, you servant, that I would have any cobwebs in my head and just clear it out, Lord. Allow the Holy Spirit just to work through me for your glory, Lord. I pray for the hearts and the hearers of this message, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would just speak to them and pierce their hearts. Lord, I pray that we would live on the mission for you. Lord, we would be a church that consistently seeks the lost, and teaches the saved. Lord, I pray right now that if there is anyone here today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that today would be the day of salvation for them. Lord, may I decrease and you increase now as I proclaim your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I have entitled today's message, Voices in the Church. Voices in the church. You see, the, the mission of the church is, is not a mystery. It is laid out for us in God's word in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. We are called to go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything that we have been commanded. And we are given the promise that the Holy Spirit will be with us to the end of the ages. We are called as a church not to make Christians, but to make disciples. A disciple of Christ is one who is making other disciples for Christ. I think about what an honor and a privilege it is to be an ambassador for Christ Church. Yeah. We get to tell people about Jesus. We get to tell people about the saving grace, the mercy, the hope that is in Christ Jesus. People who are saved are sent. May we never forget our mission and our purpose as a church. If you realize what you have been saved from, you can't help but share other people about the grace and the mercy and the love of Jesus Christ. Without Jesus, there is no hope. But with Jesus, there is eternal hope. John 14, 6 says it like this. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no one, I repeat, no one comes to the Father except through me in his name of Jesus Christ. May we keep that in the forefront of our thought when we speak the gospel to people. I'm beyond blessed and thankful for all that, that God has allowed us to see and be a part of here in the well in our two and a half years as a church. You know, when we came here, some of you may know this, one of the, we, we took some uh, cards and we, we went out and we just started telling people that we're starting a church at the Beacon Theater. We'd love to have you come. And one of the first people that we met was this guy who was standing on the corner. If you're from Hobo, you know the corner I'm talking about, right? <laughs> just standing on the corner. And, uh, and we invited him to church. And he was a little mean. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you want to accept it. You're here today. You know what I'm saying? You're here. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, come and check this church out. And you know, about three months ago, I, I got to see this man. Um, Come and he says, Look at me, Pastor. I, I'm a changed man because of that gospel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the power That's of the gospel. Right. And then this man walks sometimes up to three miles each way just to be in church. Hallelujah. I mean, I'm thankful for what God has allowed us to see in the lives that have been changed by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have seen heroin addicts come to Christ. We, yeah. we have seen homeless people not only get off the streets, but get jobs and houses. We've seen homeless people come to Christ. Uh, we've seen atheists come to Christ. And not just one. We've seen lots of atheists come to Christ. 
And I believe that there is so much more that God wants to do in and through us. So here is the warning and the exhortation to the church today. We must guard ourselves from becoming comfortable and lukewarm in Christ. Like what we have done is enough or, or we have done our part. It's a reason that I have grilled into your head the number one saying at Beacon Hill Church. Get comfortable being uncomfortable. I never want this church to get complacent from the mission that we have been called to do here in the well. That is to tell people about Jesus Christ. Do you realize that there are still 3 billion people in this world who have never even heard the name of Jesus Christ? May we proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ with boldness from the corner to the ends of the earth. May God use us to make an impact for his glory. And we must continually, we must continually keep Christ and the cross as our focus. You know, while we have been blessed to see many people come to Christ, my favorite salvation is the next one. Thank you. Yes. I love seeing the joy in people's eyes in their in their faces when they realize that they have been set free. Yes. They have been delivered from the bondage of sin and have been given eternal life in Christ Jesus. Right, yes. We didn't come. We didn't come to the well to build a mega church. We came to the well to build a redeemed church. Amen. We came to the well to, to, to have people who realize what they have been saved from and to live on mission for Jesus Christ. And I believe that, that a majority of church plants, they start with that same focus. They, they start with the desire for, to meet a need in the community, to, to share Jesus in the community. Sure, there's some prosperity churches that start for their own glory and to pad their pockets, but I believe that's another topic, another sermon. Yes, amen. But I believe the majority of churches start off on fire for Jesus, and eventually they lose their way. You know, I heard a story about a church in Atlanta Man, they were doing a, a wonderful work for Christ, and yet, much like our church, they have to get by on faith. Their offering plates don't often overflow, and so somebody in the church came out with an idea to start selling chicken dinners after church to raise some funds for the church. And man, one person in this church could cook a mean chicken dinner. Mm -hmm. You ever had some good fried chicken? You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's glorious, man. And so, it like lip smacking the good chicken. And so, it was so good that people lined up to buy this chicken. So, they eventually cut back on the church services to meet the demands of the people coming for the chicken. Yep. Uh, eventually, they literally closed the church doors and all they sell is chicken. And the story goes that you can find them today called the Church of God Grill in Atlanta, Georgia. Oh Tim Keller, in his epic book, Center Church, gives the warning that every church, regardless how theologically sound it is, loses its focus at some point or another. And so you've got to ask yourself, how does this happen? How does a church go from being so on fire for Jesus to being the Church of God Grill? And I think we see some of that in this passage this morning. I think that we see that there are competing voices in the church. And we need to understand this from this passage. We see this in verses 13 through 18. If you have your Bibles open, you can, you can read along. But this is our last week in the book of Malachi. I, I decided to condense the last two messages into one because it's Easter next week and doing a turn and burn message on Easter just didn't seem like that was friendly, you know? So <laughs> uh, I decided to do all of Malachi today. But Malachi had been sent by God to proclaim the message of repentance and returning to a thriving relationship with God to the people of Israel. And so in, in this remaining verses, we see something very interesting in these verses. We see two conversations taking place 
We see the conversations taking place behind church people. These conversations are between people who claim to know God but didn't and people who claim to know God and did. This may come to as a shock to you. But do you realize that there are people in the church that are not in the kingdom? Yeah. You know, I've been going through this book that is called The Unsaved Christian. There are people that, that think they're all right. They, they've said some words of salvation. They've even gone through the, uh, the ritual act of baptism. They have gotten wet. They may serve the church, give to the church. They may be faithful attenders in the church, but they do not know Jesus Christ as Lord of their lives. Right. Some of you go, Pastor, how can you tell the difference? To be fair, I can't. That's God's job. That's right. It's my job to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right. We're going to see in the next section how God separates the two. But this text shows us traits of those who play church and those who are being the church. Make sure you are in the group who is being the church. Yes, and if you're in the church and you're playing church, then may you repent today and you live on mission for Christ. We see this in verse 14 and 15, the distinction. We see those who complain about God. He, throughout this book, God has laid out to the people of Israel what was going through their minds. He has literally posed the question and the answer before they even get a chance to speak it themselves. And that should be scary for each and every single one of us. Do you know that God knows everything that you're thinking? Oh, yeah. sure. There is not anything that you are thinking about that can be hidden from God. God knows every thought that you have. You may fool some people, but you will not fool the only one that matters, God. Yeah. They were saying in their hearts, it was useless to serve God. They have gone so far to say, what have we gained from serving God? And I want to stop right there. I know that there are people who come to church, who, who look for a church, for what they can get out of the church. They're trying to find the right fit for their family. I, I, I remember my first pastor in my last place, the first day that I was a pastor, I hadn't even met anybody yet. This lady comes by and drops off her keys to the church saying, I'm going to another church that, that plays music that soothes my heart a little better. Mm -hmm. And it, it, just, it just broke my heart, man, when I sat there and I watched this happen. You know, when you're looking for a church, Find a church that is unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that preaches the word of God, and want to reach people for Christ. And find out how you can get plugged into that church. I pray you will see that this is one of those churches, and I pray that you will make us your church home. But find a church that is unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let me answer this question for you. When they said, what benefit is it for us in serving God? What are we getting out of serving God? You know what you get when you come to God? You get God. Amen. You get God. Amen. What else do you need, church? Amen. God plus nothing equals everything. Amen. There is nothing better in this world than having a relationship with a risen Savior. Yeah, exactly. The more that you serve Him, the more that you get to know Him, the more you want of Him. If you need anything else but God to make you content and happy in this world, it will never be enough. No. But I'm here today to tell you, God's enough. God is all you need. Come to church to get God. See, these complainers, they, they had thought that following God and having a relationship with God was something that you did on the outside. You, you came up to church and you went through the ritual motions. You, you walked morefully before the Lord. They were focusing on their outward relationship where God is concerned with the inside out. He wants your heart. He wants your heart. He doesn't want you just just to go through the motions. He, he wants you to love him and, and be transformed by him. And, and I've seen 
people that Malachi is talking about in church. Not that there's not a time to be reverent and walking around, but have you ever been to church and you just see people that just look like they hate being there? Yes. Like they just got this warning thing. It looks so painful. I'm like, man, you don't need to be in church. You need to be at a CVS or doctor's office. You've got to get something to get that out of you. It's crazy to watch how painful it is for some people to come to church. And then lastly, Malachi talks about those who long for what the world appears to have. See the wicked appearing to prosper, even mocking God and getting away with it. You know, it doesn't bother me what the world says about God or how much that they appear to prosper. My Bible says that if the world is what you want, then that's what you get. You know, it, it doesn't it doesn't bother me. It doesn't impress me to meet millionaires or billionaires. It doesn't impress me to meet stars. It doesn't impress me if you have a big house or a fancy car. I only see two types of people, saved and unsaved. That's all that matters to me. So make sure you understand your purpose in church to worship God and not yourself, to be encouraged by other believers, to grow in Christ, to be sent out on mission for themselves. Now I can give example after example of people who just hated being in church, man. They just complained about everything, but I'm going to bite my tongue this morning and not share that with you. But then I thought, biting my tongue in church, and so I really need to share some of these examples with you, all right? <laughs> There, I remember one time when I was chairman of the deacons at, at my first church, and I remember having a meeting with this guy, and the pastor brought me in, and this, this guy literally said this. He said, he said, I don't care what the Bible says. This is what I want. Mm -hmm. And this is a leader. This was a teacher. Mm -hmm. The new people need to follow that. Mm -hmm. Pastor, as long as you play two hymns and two contemporary mm -hmm. songs, I'll be happy. Mm -hmm. I didn't I didn't wear a tie one sermon out of 250 in my last church. One day, one Sunday, out of 250. And I, I guess because they were afraid that I would, you know, start progressing and end up looking like, I guess, well, this. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm just, this is not honoring God. And so they, they, the one Sunday that I didn't wear a tie, you know that they filled up the complaint box? Oh, come on. They filled up the complaint box. And some of y'all are saying, y'all have a complaint box at your last church? No. But they just took the offering plate as the U.S. mail. Oh and let me share with you, the offering plate is not for you to give suggestions. The offering plate is to put your tithes and offerings to God. All right? So I've seen this over and over again. I could go on and on, but I've had a list of complainers over. I mean, I've had people argue about where to put plants in a church. You know what? People said, this is my seed. Guess what? Christ paid for every single one of these Amen. That's right. So it's his to start with. Right. So you have this one side, those who complain about everything. And then you see in verse 16, those who fear God. You can almost picture this. People were over in this area complaining and the remnant just quietly gathered up and, and they just wanted to worship God and, and, and they just wanted to serve him. They didn't complain. They, 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 they wanted to encourage each other and edify one another. The words that, that came out of their mouths, they weren't concerned if God heard it or not. Because they knew that their hearts were to bring glory to God in all that they did. They may have been the silent majority, but their words spoke volumes, church. They worship in spirit and truth, and God took notice of how they worshiped. Not outwardly, but inwardly. Their neighbors might have thought that they were absolutely crazy for how they worshiped. They might have thought that they were wasting their time on God when they were investing in eternity with God. The world is so concerned with what people think about them and say about them. And you know what? I could care less one bit what the world thinks about me. Careless. Amen. People think I'm nuts, that's fine. I live by Jonathan Edwards' two resolutions. I live by what Jonathan Edwards says. His first resolution is, I will live for Christ. And his second resolution is, if no one else will, I still will. It doesn't bother me. So I'm okay with being in 
in the minority. I, I'm okay with being labeled a Jesus freak. It doesn't bother me when one bit because you know why? This world is not my home. I am just passing through on my way to heaven, church. Right. Right. So while the majority can mock church or, or go through the motions of attending church, you be in the minority that wants to be the church. God is watching. You don't need to worry about being part of the crowd. You don't need to. You step up and stand out in a world that wants everyone to conform. God claimed them as his own, and God promised to spare them in future judgment, where everybody will see the difference between the righteous and the wicked. So don't get discouraged. There will be some times when you will feel bypassed. There will be some times where you will feel overlooked or unappreciated. Just remember who you serve and why you serve. That's right, that's right. You want to give God the glory. Yes. If the crowds are small, we'll keep walking with Jesus. Yes. If we only had one person to listen to this message today, I'm going to preach the same message. Yes, hallelujah. And I'm going to preach it with the same passion. If this house was filled, we're going to keep on preaching Jesus. Yes, the crowds may be small sometimes, but your treasures are not of this world, but in the one to come. So be a voice in the church that point people to Jesus and not a voice in the church that keep people away from Jesus. Yes. You know, there's a, there's a whole story that I read this week, a conversation with J.D. Greer, who's the president of Southern Baptist Con Convention this year, and, and, and Andy Stanley. They were going back and forth about different belief systems and, and their thoughts, and, but both of them had the same passion. What has happened to the people who were in the church that have now run away from the church? Yeah. You know, there, there's so many people that have been hurt by the church. They're going away. And I believe that's because there's so many voices that are just complaining about God. And there's few people that are just sold out worshiping that's God. Right. People need to see authentic worship. That's right. So I want to encourage you in my second point is to keep eternity in focus. Yeah. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Keep eternity in focus. This section reminds me, while I'm ready for heaven, and it also reminds me why I'm not. See, because I, I get a glimpse of heaven in this passage. I get a glimpse of what's to come. You know, heaven, there will be no more pain. There will be no more sickness. There will be no cancer. There will be no crying. There will be no more. There will be, you just see this. There will be unleashed. And there will be healing. And there will be joy. And forever. And I tell you, for now, I just long to be in heaven. And I can't wait to be with Jesus. It just gives you a glimpse of it. Matter of fact, when you go through the Bible, you see things like you see it here where it describes what heaven will be like. And do you know why that we never have a definitive description of what heaven will be like? It's because there is no words in our vocabulary to describe how awesome heaven is going to be. It's going to be glorious, church. So I personally can't wait to be there. But at the same time, like Paul said in Philippians, he goes, you know, I desire to depart and be with you. But I know that I must remain because I still have work to do. That's right. This is the reason why I'm not ready to go be with the Lord. And that's because there are still people who do not know Jesus Christ as Lord of their lives. And they have no clue what awaits them in eternity. You know, Scripture gives a, just a glimpse of hell here in this passage. And you know, you know, I remember when I, when I first came uh, to my, my last church, uh, somebody asked me in the preview, they go, Pastor, are you going to talk about hell? I'm like, it's in the Bible, we're going to talk about it. That's right. But hell has largely been left out of preaching because it doesn't fill up the seats and it doesn't fill up the offering plate. Well, I'm not concerned about either one of those. I'm concerned about your salvation. Yeah. And so hell is something that we must talk about. If we really love people, if we really love people, then we must talk about hell. Because I believe heaven is real, and I believe hell is real. Just because we don't talk about it doesn't mean it's not real. We can deny it and ignore judgment as much as we want, but Malachi's words are still true. The day is coming. And make no mistake about it, Jesus Christ is coming back, church. Yes. He is coming back. The day of judgment is coming. Jesus Christ will come back before I even finish the next words out of my mouth. For the saved, it will be a glorious day. For the unsaved, it will be treacherous beyond description. 
Scripture says that the day is like a burning oven and the wicked are like stubble. When the stubble hits the oven, it is burned. And when the wicked hit judgment, they are consumed. The outcome for those who do not know Christ is complete destruction. We see in the scripture and in, in, in the Bible just some truths about hell. One, that hell is a real place. Right. Yes, it is. Hell is a separation from God and all that is good. Right. Hell is a place of just punishment. Hell is a place where you will have memory and it will be consistently agonizing pain. It is a place of hopelessness. It's also a place where you don't have to go and neither do your friends. I want to close with a story about a guy named Mark. I've got a video um, that I might put up on our Facebook page of me talking to Mark. Uh, when I first started, just started preaching on the streets, I met Mark. I still remember him wearing this red sweatshirt and hat. And uh, he was homeless. His father, he didn't know, and he was living underneath the bridge. And this group of men went and shared the gospel with Mark. They went up under the bridge and shared the gospel with Mark, and it changed his life. I remember listening to him saying, you know, I, I, I may not have an earthly father, but I have a heavenly father. That's right. and, and he went on Fridays and Saturday nights in the Gilman Court and Mosby Court sharing the gospel door by door. And if you don't know those names and you don't know what those projects are, it makes Davisville and Thomas Roth look like a daycare center. And yet he went sharing the gospel. And you know what he said? He said, I picture every single person with flames on them. And I've just got to know whether or not they're going to heaven or hell. This morning I'm picturing flames all over the place. I just want to know, do you know Jesus Christ? Are you going to heaven or hell? If there's any question whatsoever, I pray that you understand that today can be the day of salvation for them. Romans 3.23 says that we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. And when I talked about earlier that some people think the word saved them, no, it's not. But if you believe Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that is Lord, he is the highest priority of your life, and you believe that, that God rose him from the dead, then you shall be saved. It doesn't say may be saved. It might not say one day in the future. It says today is the day of salvation in my Bible. And today you can have that grace and mercy in Christ Jesus. But maybe you're sitting here today and you've heard this message. See, because quite frankly, there are loved ones who I wish I could have shared the gospel with who are dead and gone now. There's nothing I can do about that, but I can do something about you today. I can share with you the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, you come forth. But if you have a neighbor, you have a co-worker, you have uh, somebody in your family, you have somebody that doesn't know Jesus Christ, then we want to intercede. We believe in the power of prayer. We might not be the ones that get to share the gospel with them, but I believe that God is powerful enough to send somebody right now to share the gospel with that person. Do you believe in the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Do you believe our God is that big? And I encourage you to not take this time of invitation lightly. We'll have a prayer team down here. We want to pray for you, intercede with you. I don't know what God is laying on your heart, but it's time to be the church. Yes. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you and I praise you for who you are. I thank you for being a God who loves us. A, a God who loves us so much that he sent his only begotten son that whoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Lord, I thank you and I praise you for who you are. Lord, I believe, matter of fact, I don't know personally, but I believe that people here that don't know you are going to say that today needs to be a day of salvation for them. Lord, I don't know about, about them right now, but I know when I made that walk down that aisle, it's not the walk that saved me, it's the heart transformation that's already happening, but I know that I was nervous and I was worried about what other people thought of me, but I'd rather be known in heaven than be known on this earth. Amen. So Lord, I pray that people would have the boldness and to come forth and just say, look, I need Jesus this morning. I want to turn. We've already got three baptisms on Easter Sunday, and I would love to have 30. All right? So, Lord, have your way. Have your way this morning. Lord, we got two songs, but if it's one song or 40 songs, have your way this invitation time. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand.